about that. No, no problem. It starts in late 1941 and covers baseball through World War II to its conclusion and then up to the 1948 season when Cleveland won the pennant and won the World Series. There was quite a bit of unrest in the country, of course, with the war going on in Europe and in, uh, over in the South Pacific. Things were very difficult for everybody, and baseball was, was no exception. There were travel restrictions on the ball clubs where they could not train in Florida or California. They had to stay in the Midwest. There were air raid drills at the stadiums in the East. Even Cleveland had uh, an air raid drill. Or in Boston, they would have instructions for a case of a bombing on the back of your seat. You would read that and follow the instructions. Of course, nothing like that was even remotely possible, but people were that much concerned. The rosters on the teams were depleted because so many guys went overseas, about 500 major leaguers and a couple thousand minor leaguers, which caused a lot of minor leagues to go out of business and fold up. It was a difficult time during the war for everybody with rationing, with gas and food and clothing, and difficult to get tires, rubber, things like that. But baseball prevailed. Thanks to President Roosevelt, who encouraged the owners of Major League Baseball to keep playing ball because it was a good release for people, especially working in the war industry. They could leave their job at the end of the day, go to a night game and see some baseball and forget about what was happening. Once the war ended, we had a change of ownership in Cleveland. Bill Beck took over the team in 1946. And the following year, he broke the color barrier in the American League by signing Larry Doby to play for Cleveland. Jackie Robinson gets much of the publicity and the credit, deservedly so, but Larry Doby was in the exact same situation, only six weeks behind Jackie Robinson. He had to take all kinds of harassment from people everywhere, from his own teammates, but he prevailed and became a great major leaguer. The next year, Satchel Paige joined the team. The team won the pennant, went on to win the World Series, and it was a glorious time in Cleveland. But unfortunately, 1948 was the very last World Series win for a Cleveland organization. We're still looking for another one some 74 years later. I was going to ask you, Scott, I, looking at this, it, was, it just struck me, what kind of owner was um, Mr. D? With, with racial integration with, with the team, how did that process unfold for, for the the Bill Veck was a very progressive guy. He was an innovator. He also was a showman and a promoter. And his main goal at all times was to put people in the stands. And one thing he did know, if he brought Larry Dolby to Cleveland, the first African-American in the American League, attendance would definitely increase just from the novelty. People would want to see what it was all about. Not to mention the Black community in Cleveland would probably come out in much larger numbers. But he did want to do the right thing. He did want to integrate the game in the American League and pave the way for others. So he was a forward thinker. I think a guy that was ahead of his time. He wasn't afraid of the criticism. And the thing was, he wanted a great ball player. And one of the best out there happened to be Larry Doby. Vec thought, basically, I don't care what his skin color is. He can help us win a pennant. And that, that's what happened. Vec was a shrewd guy. He was, very, as I mentioned, very progressive. And uh, he left his mark in, in Major League Baseball. Now, Satchel Page, when he joined the team, um, was he? How old was he at the, t- at the time he joined the, the the Indian? We think he was probably forty-one, right around okay. there. You would say he was thirty-nine. Okay. Nobody was quite sure about it, but he could still pitch at at forty-one, whatever age he was. He pitched very well down the stretch. Cleveland used him extensively in, in August and September. He won six out of seven ball games. He was excellent, really helped us to win the pennant. So we had something left in the tank. But again, more and more people came to Cleveland Stadium because everybody knew of Satchel Page and wanted to see him in action. And on the road, crowds would increase by 30, 40% when Satchel was pitching. So he was a real uh, publicity guy for the American League, but he still had some good pitching talent left, and he did help Cleveland again, along with Dolby and others, to win the pennant. He was a, a good acquisition. Again, Bill Beck knew what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to ask you a little bit. Someone told me I should probably ask about game one of the series and how Bob Feller was kind of a tragedy for Bob Feller. It, it really was. He and Bob had joined the team in 1936 as a teenager, a junior in high school. This was his first chance to win a World Series game, to pitch in a World Series, and he pitched fantastic. The game was a shutout. 
through eight full innings. Johnny Sane was the pitcher for Boston. He was an excellent pitcher too. So it was up for grabs going into uh, the bottom of the eighth. The first man got on base. He was sacrificed to second. And Cleveland had a great pickoff play. It was coordinated between the pitcher, the catcher, and Lou Boudreau, our player manager at shortstop. He would give a signal from a shortstop position to the catcher, who would then signal the pitcher. They would count to two, turn around and fire to second base. And Boudreau would come in and put the tag on the runner. They executed it perfectly, but the umpire was a National League umpire who had been told to watch out for the pickoff play, but he wasn't paying attention. He was out of position. And it looked very clearly like the runner was out, but he was called, say, film after the World Series that was produced showed he was out by about four to five inches. There was no question. Of course, the next batter up, single to left field, the run scored. We lost the game one to nothing. Feller came back for game five, but he didn't have his good stuff. He was knocked out of the game, and that was it for him. He would never have another chance to pitch in the World Series again. He had a fabulous career, but I think it always haunted him that he never was able yeah. to win a World Series game. This was very controversial, too. So this, uh, the 19, um, this era, the World War II era, was very significant for the Indians then. So this is, is this safe to say this is a third book and a trilogy, kind of, right? Is that safe to say? Yeah, that, that was my intention, okay. to cover okay. the team from about 1927 to 1948, from a new owner to a new owner and to a pennant in a World Series. That was my intention when I started about uh, eight or nine years ago with the three books. Yeah, yeah. And so as a young person, as a so you probably grew up loving baseball as a child, correct? I, and I did. I did. As a five-year-old, I tell the story a lot. I learned how to read by checking the box scores in the, in the morning paper. I would get on the floor, look at the box score. I learned to recognize the names and the numbers. I could tell who got a hit, who had a home run. I could recognize the names. And from there, I learned how to read. But I've been a fan since I'm five years old. And as I mentioned earlier, I was at the game today. Um, I, it just never, uh, I never lost my passion for the game, even at my advanced age. It's been like some 60 some years of going to see them play ball, but uh, I still love it. I think it's, I think it's just a great game. Outstanding. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to briefly here to David Myers and Elise Myers Walker. Thank you, you two for coming in to the uh, session tonight and you're broadcasting live from Bunker. <laughs> uh, un undisclosed basement. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your newest book? Want to go? Okay. <laughs> Our newest book is Reverse Underground Railroad in Ohio. Uh, and this is, we, we had another book two years ago called Historic Black Settlements in Ohio. And people yeah. wanted to make that an Underground Railroad book. And even though it's not precisely an Underground Railroad book, it was just the story of, of black settlements that arose in Ohio prior to the Civil War, many of whom, uh, many of these settlements contained fugitive slaves, free blacks, uh, former slaves who were, you know, emancipated. And, but people didn't have a niche to put that one in because there aren't many books about that kind of thing. But as we were doing that in our research, naturally, we ran across a lot of underground railroad material as well. And since we're usually working on, you know, about five books simultaneously, <laughs> this one emerged two years later, the reverse underground railroad in Ohio. And the significance of the title is this, we focus on the underground railroad, which everybody presumably knows, you know, it involves fugitive slaves making their way into the North and to the, you know, the free states and some of continuing on to Canada. But basically that's, you're looking through the wrong end of the telescope because there was a mechanism in place to keep them from doing that. And it was called the law. <laughs> and so what we did is, is uh, wrote a book that really reflects how the law changed from the time prior to Ohio becoming a state in 1803 up to you know, the, the Civil War and even into it, and how the wall, law changed regarding fugitive slaves and how court decisions affected the status of fugitive slaves and how uh, uh, you know, originally you had a group of people, well, you had three groups of people in the United States. 
You had those that were supported slavery, those that were opposed to slavery, and those that were kind of indifferent to slavery. And what happened in the course of the changes in the law is the people in the, the middle, the indifferent people, were forced to deal with it. And they were forced primarily because of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, which for the first time made them in, uh, uh, subject to being involved in the pursuit and capture of fugitive slaves. Prior to that, they the law just said they weren't allowed to interfere if a slave was being you know, pursued and captured. Now they could be mandated to assist in that. U.S. Marshals were mandated to assist the slave owners in tracking down their slaves, and just the man on the street could be kind of uh, deputized to help as well. So uh, it, it changed attitudes tremendously regarding slavery. And you couldn't just be ambivalent anymore and stay yeah. on the sidelines. You were now forced to actively assist and in it, slavery continuing. If, yeah. If if you saw someone, if you were near someone, you could basically be deputized and now you have to do it. And if you don't, you're in trouble. So it really did change public sentiment for those people, like you said, in the middle. Yeah. So you had people, you know, prior to that, they're just kind of watching this spectacle unfold. And they might see somebody, you know, slave owners or their agents coming into Ohio and pursuing slaves and capturing them. Some might elect to interfere, but they did so at the risk of being jailed themselves. Um, but after 1850, you know, <laughs> you better sure you weren't around when that was occurring because you could be dragged into the mess. And uh, it, it was the, the law was changed. The Fugitive Slave Law was passed because the slave owners in the South feared that they were losing a lot of their slaves. I mean, it was <laughs> they weren't losing as many as were being born. That was for sure. So the the you know the total number of slaves in the South remained just continued to grow actually, but they pushed for this lay you know they, it kind of galled them especially those along the Ohio River galled them that these slaves were escaping into Ohio or to Indiana or into Pennsylvania, and so they got Congress to pass this law, and that just changed everything. And they thought people were you know. Uh, getting in their way before, well, they were really were getting in their way now. And you had large groups of people, such as in Oberlin, there's an Oberlin Wellington rescue was uh, had to do with a fugitive slave. You know, a large group of 20 some people were involved in rescuing a slave rather than just one or two. So um, it was a, a major point in changing public attitude. Yeah, and in this book, um, I, I, he always describes it a little bit drier than I think it really is. We go, <laughs> we go into detail about individual stories, um, individual yeah. court cases, and the actual people, the um, the enslaved people that were involved, the um, lawyers who were involved. There's in all our books, even though they're history, I think there are definitely good guys and bad guys, and we've got good guys and bad guys here too, um, and people who change, people whose opinions change and their sides change. Um, so yeah we do provide examples to go with every mm -hmm. change in the law or every court decision and as it so happened because there were more fugitive slave routes through ohio than anywhere else and so more fugitive slaves came through ohio than anywhere else uh the, the lion's share of the court cases took place here too and so uh people were watching ohio to see how this was being handled yeah and you've got some really famous and and heartbreaking tragic tragic, tragic slave due to slave stories that occurred here in ohio and we go into considerable detail on those uh more so than most people have actually unless they've written a book specifically on that particular subject but it, it's you know it covers all of the state you know there's hardly a county that wasn't involved to some extent and uh and that's only the cases you know, that we were tying directly to the law. We've got another book that'll be out in a couple of years, <laughs> which is kind of the rest of the story. Uh, the one was there weren't, weren't as important, but still were every bit as dramatic. And uh, so I had a question for you about the, the process. These agents, were they, well, they were bounty hunters. 
Yes. And so would they just like come across the Ohio River? Was there a process? How would they usually do? Engage with local law enforcement, tell them they were in town looking for somebody, and then how did that usually work? How it depended they... on it depended mm -hmm. on what year it was. And okay. this is because of the evolution of the, of the law. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Ohio was the first state carved out of the, the Northwest Territory. And the Northwest Ordinance had really allowed slave owners to come into Northwest Territory in search of fugitive slaves. That was stipulated in the Northwest Ordinance. At the same time, they stipulated that no states made out of the Northwest Territory can be slave states. That's why Ohio was the first state to be a free state created from, the, a free state. from its birth, from its inception. Uh, back then, it was pretty much a, a local issue. And so it was, you know, you had local marshals were, were, and local judges were involved in the process. And when the state was fairly sparsely populated, it, you know, it wasn't unusual for them to slip into the state, go look for whoever they were looking for, grab them and haul them back down across the river. Or somebody resembling them as yeah. much as they felt necessary. So that, that's one of the issues that came about is, you know, the because no, uh, to, to begin with, there weren't any, it wasn't any particular paperwork that a free black would have showing that he was free. It was incumbent upon him to prove that he was. And so they would come up into Ohio and grab just a likely suspect and haul him back down to, to Kentucky. And they did a little bit of judge shopping in doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Jerry Finney, who was in Columbus, you know, the, 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 the slave catcher went around and kind of checked with various judges in Columbus to find one that was sympathetic to his cause. And this judge enabled, <laughs> set up a situation where Jerry Finney was kidnapped in his office and that's because the guy was pro-slavery in his sentiments. Uh, that's another important thing to remember about Ohio and much of the United States is it was almost you know a 50-50 split when it came to the issue of slavery. And you, so that's why everybody was fighting for those, you know, the, the indifferent ones in the middle. So a lot of pro-Southern sympathizers settled in Southern Ohio in particular. Now, the ones in northwestern Ohio tended to be more abolitionist in their thinking. So you get to Columbus, which is in the middle, and they're shopping around for a judge. And what started occurring, which we talk about too, is they were looking for anybody who was a fugitive slave or could be passed off for a fugitive slave. Mm -hmm. And they started kidnapping children. And the kid children that they kidnapped tended to be lighter and lighter in complexion. And all at once you had white people becoming alarmed because they'd see these black kids that were being kidnapped that were as light as their own kids. And so they realized that nobody is safe. This is from our historic black uh, settlements book, uh, first illustration in it. And it's um, two enslaved children who were toured and uh, as you can see, the girl's complexion, I think matches about mine, yeah. um, which I call paper white. So this this became not only because of the laws could they no longer ignore what was going on and have, you know be agnostic about the concept, but now you have a concern, well, wait a minute, what about my my white, am I as a white person, what about my children? Are they safe? If they are, if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, if they have their hair done a certain way, if they have a suntan, could somebody just snatch them off the street? And whether that was a realistic fear or not, it was definitely started yeah. to help change the sediment. But when you talk about heartbreaking stories, well, Jerry Finney was one mm -hmm. because he was, had lived in Columbus for about 10 years, was very popular, married, had children. And it, as it turns out, he was a fugitive slave. But there's some question about whether he was uh, legally entitled to live in Ohio because he had been brought here by, uh, with the knowledge of his owner. And that was another issue that had to be settled in court. But he, they ended up hauling him back down to Kentucky, trying him. You know, you had this tug of war that would take place between the governor of Ohio and the governor of Kentucky. And you go have lawyers that would go down there and try to get him out. He ended up spending a number of months in prison in Kentucky, contracted 
tuberculosis. So when he was finally purchased by people in Columbus in order to get his freedom, he came back you know, triumphantly to Columbus and then died of consumption. Uh. And you know, another famous story, you know, one of the most famous is Margaret Garner, who came across you know, with her family to Cincinnati. And when they were captured, she killed her daughter, Mary, and was attempting to kill her other children as well, rather than allowing them to go back into slavery. Uh, this is best known as, um, it was um, uh, dramatized by Toni Morrison in Beloved, Yeah. Um, that story. And it was, um, you know, made all the, all the papers at the time and was a very big deal. And you think about just the, the horror of that, that um, she's, she's been called the American Medea, the, the woman that would kill her children, um, which in Medea, it's because of how hard yeah. and cold and awful she is, whereas Margaret was trying to prevent them from a life of enslavement that she was very yeah. familiar with. Yeah, and the attorney in that case was Salmon P. Chase, who later became governor of Ohio and then was part of Lincoln's cabinet. And they, he, they came up with this idea to try to keep her from going back down to Kentucky of charging her with murder, mm -hmm. thinking that murder would trump being a fugitive slave. Yeah. At least that way she would be tried in the courts of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And they were optimistic. Fairest trial she could get. The fairest trial she could get, and that she might only have to serve a few years even if she's convicted. But because it was being determined by US commissioners at that time, because it was after, you know, they, they had it in their court, they ended up sending her back to Kentucky and back into slavery. And, and it was just tragic all the way around. Yeah, yeah. That's a very fascinating topic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to move on to Janet Shaler here next. Um, Janet, would you like to talk, talk to us about your, your book? Sure. Well, this is my book, Trouble on Scioto's Waters. And it's really a comprehensive history and a guide to the uh, Native Americans in, early in Ohio's history, uh, up until essentially the time it became a state and then into the uh, War of 1812. But I start with the Paleo Indians uh, just briefly and then transition into uh, the Adena and the Ohio Hopewell and then the Fort Ancient Culture. And then they transition again into the Eastern Woodland Indians who came uh, to Ohio. Uh, actually, some of them, they think the Shawnee may have been a part of the Fort Ancient culture and went south and then, and they completely disappeared from Ohio. Well, one time during the 1600s, there was no one who lived in Ohio. But then the Shawnee started to come back as did some uh, in, excuse me, in 17, about 1725 and others started coming in uh, such as the, uh, the Wyandots, the Miami, the Seneca, and the Delaware, who were the major ones, because I, I concentrate basically on central Ohio. <clears throat> but anyway, then, uh, of course, uh, these tribes started fighting for their land as the soldiers came in or the settlers wanted to come in. And uh, the, the fighting was fierce in Ohio. A lot of people don't know this between uh, the 1750s and then we get again to the uh, War of 1812. And one of the reasons I wanted to write this is because um, in school you learn very little about um, the Native Americans who lived in Ohio. So I had all these questions and I just started researching it. But uh, during the book, uh, uh, inside the book, I, I uh, then concentrate somewhat on uh, the great Tecumseh and Blue Jacket. And they're interesting because Blue Jacket was uh, Tecumseh's mentor. Uh, Blue Jacket was born in 1743 and Tecumseh was born about 20 years later. And uh, uh, Blue Jacket was a, um, a terrific uh, Shawnee war chief. And he, uh, was, he led the Shawnee in Lord Dunmore's war, Battle of Point Pleasant. And then he sided with the British during uh, the American Revolution. Um, then he was the leader of the resistance. The, uh, uh, the Myers were talking about uh, the opening of the Northwest Territories. Well, when, when those were opened, Blue Jacket, as well as the other Native Americans, 
really got their back up about that. And then there were a number of battles, like in seven, uh, 1790, uh, General Harmer was defeated, were defeated, they, his army was defeated by a Blue Jacket and company. 1791, the very next year, uh, General St. Clair uh, was defeated. Those are both over in the Western part between the uh, two Miami rivers. And then we get to the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794 up in um, the Toledo area. And uh, that, was a, that was a defeat for the Native Americans. And in the aftermath of that, Blue Jackets signed the Treaty of Greenville, but Tecumseh would not, he refused to sign it. And then Tecumseh goes on and uh, throughout uh, his career uh, to put together the, um, the biggest confederation of Native Americans uh, that has ever been seen in the uh, Ohio Valley. And actually his, um, his confederation was bigger than the one that um, was put together by um, Chief Sitting Bull and in the Battle of Little Bighorn. Um, Tecumseh, uh, Tecumseh and his brother who was called the prophet. And uh, just some, incre some incredible history in Ohio that so many people don't know. But anyway, I go from uh, the Native Americans <clears throat> and I have a part in the book where I talk about then uh, towards the end, uh, some great frontiersmen from Ohio. Uh, the, um, the frontiersman Jonathan Alder is very well known over in Madison County. He actually was the founder or the first settler in um, Madison County. Uh, he had been captured when he was a child uh, living in Virginia, he and a brother by the Seneca who had, uh, Ohio Seneca, who had left Ohio to go looking for a young boy to capture, to take back to Chief Logan, who had lost a, a, uh, a child, a male child, and who was about 11 years old. So they take him back and he learns all these languages. He, he learned several different languages and was able later to act as an interpreter because he did remember for a while anyway, is English. And uh, they would take him when they were going to do treaties and whatnot. But um, uh, you, have, uh, you have Jonathan Alder, you have Simon Kenton, who is a fascinating, I think, uh, frontiersman in Ohio history, who had been a friend of Daniel Boone's. Uh, he was a scout for Daniel Boone. He actually rescued Daniel Boone um, down in Boonesboro at one time. And the amazing thing about him, Simon Kenton, is that he was one of the very few frontiersmen who could uh, run and load a flintlock rifle at the same time, which they say was an absolutely amazing feat that you know no one could do that, but he could. And he was once rescued from the burn stake uh, when the Indians were going to, to kill him by Simon Gertie. Uh, he fought in the ba Battle of Fallen Timbers. Um, and then he was at the Battle of the Thames in Ontario when uh, Tecumseh and Chief Roundhead were both killed. And as a result of that bat particular battle up in Ontario, Canada, that was really kind of the end of, um, of the Ohio Native Americans going to battle. They just really kind of um, took a step back and started to leave Ohio so that by 1846, uh, the last of the Native Americans in Ohio, which were the Wyandots, left Ohio. And as you know, there are no uh, reservations in Ohio. There's no land here that's, uh, that's owned. And I wrap up the book, just, by the way, with uh, uh, a story of the story of Colonel William Crawford, who did die the most horrible death uh, up in Wyandotte County. He was burned at the stake by the Wyandots in the Delaware um, in revenge for Ganaden Hutton, although he himself was not present at Ganada, the Ganaden Hutton massacre, but his men were. So um, uh, that kind of gives you an overall uh, look at uh, what I'm doing. But because they were the first Ohioans, I just think it's really important that if anybody wants to uh, start to uh, learn about Ohio's 
history as far as the Native Americans and frontiers go. Uh, my book is a good place to start. <clears throat> I was going to ask you, have you always been interested in this period of, of history, Ohio history? What brought you to this subject? Yes, I, I've always been, I, I did not, uh, I'm a journalist. I've been a, a journalist for 50 years. I didn't major in, in history, but I've always loved loved it and, and I love to read it. Um, I just live about a mile from the Scioto River, which is really how the this whole thing started. Uh, when I uh, first, uh, I purchased, my husband and I purchased our first house in 1974, uh, we found arrowheads, uh, we had five acres and we would find arrowhead heads out in the yard. And I, it all hit me that yes, these people lived here. They lived right where I'm standing. My house is sitting where I had a creek that ran through the back and they hunted all, all through here. So it just kind of grew and grew in my mind. I kept, uh, having questions about this, that, and the other thing. And finally, at this period in my life, I was able to, to actually really start a couple of years of research and answer some of the questions that I've had. And um, it's, it's really been a fulfilling um, project to do for me. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I would like to continue writing about them in the future. Well, you mentioned research. I had a uh, question for everybody. I was going to go around and ask them about their research process, their methodology, and how they construct their uh, their uh, books. I know with when you're every time you're talking about nonfiction, there's a lot of research involved. So, so how you know what kind of research? How do you how do you do your research for a book like this? How do you put everything together? Okay. Well, um, I started several years ago. Uh, my first stop was uh, the Grand Avenue Library in downtown Columbus which you know, is a wonderful place to start and dug out some old books, started taking notes. Uh, and then I went around to many of the libraries in the Columbus area, Bexley, um, several others. And of course, my own library, the Southwest Public Libraries. Um, and one thing led to the other. Each book that I would read, then I would uh, check the references and I would see more books that I wanted to read and, and magazine articles and, um, uh, authors that I wanted uh, to kind of glean some some things from. And then uh, in addition to all that, uh, I started driving around Ohio with my husband when he had time, uh, going up to Wyandotte and Crawford counties doing research. We went down as far as far south as um, Adams County um, and uh, with this, the wonderful Serpent Mound, which has always fascinated me. Uh, went to Fort A Ancient, went to many sites, uh, as many as I could kind of handle here and there. And then a lot of, you know, my area, uh, there, even in Grove City uh, and just our surrounding area between the Scioto River and the Big Darby Creek, which is to our, our west, I kind of live in between there and I've, I'm in the fourth generation of my family to live here. So I know the territory very, very well. And uh, um, just really got down as deep as I could get uh, to, um, to research these things and to try to understand what their lives were like and, and how, what it took then for them to leave the beautiful state of Ohio, which has so many natural resources and, and great hunting, fishing, and all the things that it had, to take off because they thought it was crowded and they didn't, couldn't stand it anymore and they headed west. So um, that's really where I'm coming from in, in this. It's just a journey for me to understand these people better. What about you, Scott? What kind of, uh, what's your process like putting all these uh stories together and all the history of the team? Well, the first thing that, that I always do is the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. They have player files, manager files, uh, stadium <clears throat> files, and everybody who played. And usually the files have a lot of information in them. They have clippings and articles, sometimes personal letters from the players and their families. That gets me started in the direction that I want to go. And from there, I'll try and contact historical societies and libraries in the towns that these guys were born in. Usually a library will keep a file 
or the historical society will keep a file on the more famous people that come from that county or, or that city. That usually leads to more information. Um, a real good source is if you can, which I've been lucky to do for, for my books, is locate a grandson or granddaughter of the ball player, someone who is like the family historian, and they will have lots of stories. Some of them actually met them, they knew them a little bit, so I would get some inside stories from them. That would help a great deal. Here in Cleveland, it, um, Cleveland Public Library has the Plain Dealer, the Press, and the Cleveland News on microfilm. So I spent a lot of Saturdays there looking up dates and significant events to see what was written at the time. That usually gives me a good basis. And then I branch out from there, like some old baseball magazines, the sporting news, and I'm able to find things that I need. And then background on the various cities and things and all about Cleveland at the time. What was Cleveland like in the 40s doing research with that? And that usually gives me a real good foundation to start writing from. And if, if I miss something, I'll stop and go back and do some more research on it. Uh, David and Elise, I have a sense that uh, you, you do a fair amount of like driving around do That's research. exactly what I was going to say. You totally <laughs> jumped me. I was going to hop on what Janet said when she said driving around Ohio. Driving around Ohio is my favorite thing to do. Um, and we definitely do it to collect stuff. Um, I think more than uh, Janet or Scott, we spend a lot of time in old articles. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, we try to get back as close to when it occurred as we can. No, so if you're looking at newspaper accounts, now that's it's kind of the place to begin if it's mentioned in the newspapers. Uh, in this particular book, you've got some court records. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting that Ohio Supreme Court decisions, they didn't start publishing them until like 1837 or thereafter. So some of the early stuff, the only record you have of it is if it was mentioned in a newspaper, you know, a contemporary newspaper. But we also found, you know, later on you've got county histories. And sometimes that gives you a clue. And you go back quite often, county histories repeat something that was previously published word for word mm -hmm. without attribution. Uh, what we try to stay away from is anything that's fairly contemporary mm -hmm. because we find that errors get compounded. People are reporting. And so it, it's, I always give the example, you know, there was a certain date in Marion, Ohio that either 1500 men in white robes Road through town, or they didn't. And it depends upon which newspaper you're reading. And so, you know, at the time, the mastheads of the newspaper told you what they stood for and told you what lens they were looking through when they wrote the article, too. You know, if they were the Republican or the Free Soiler or the Democrat or whatever, uh, you know, the, the, the abolitionist, you knew what they stood for. So you can take that into account when you're reading. What they have to say. Yeah, we always um, warn would be researchers to pay attention to articles published on or shortly after April 1st. Um, find, find the primary source because sometimes a, a joke will be published, an April Fool's Day joke will be published in one paper and it will be clear to everybody reading it that this is definitely a joke, haha, it's April Fool's. Well, two days later, somebody else picks it up and it's in another newspaper and now we don't have the date to connect it to anymore. And now it's being described as something that actually happened, whether it was something silly or, yeah, our, or, or you know, just a farcical or something. Um, the book we wrote on lynchings and mob violence, that was a case of a, of a lynching in Millersburg, Ohio, which was an April Fool's joke written by a, some newspaper guy. Uh, it wasn't an actual incident. What they did is they hung a cast iron sign that was in the shape of a person. And they gave a whole backstory to this cast iron sign about how you know, he had kind of a cold stare and he'd been mm -hmm. lounging around town for weeks and mm -hmm. all this stuff. But that was counted as a lynching in all the lynching data <laughs> because they didn't you know, catch context. that you know, weeks or months later, you know, they, they actually identify this as a, a hoax. And there's a, a famous incident down in Southern Ohio where supposedly these Kentucky slave hunters and slave owners came and had this shootout with these abolitionists and killed a bunch of them. And that's been repeated in some fairly well-known books, but it didn't happen. It was a hoax. And that they revealed that like three months later. Yeah. And I was suspicious because I just couldn't find it 
any record of any of these people that were killed of having ever been alive. And, you know, we know <laughs> we know from the more famous um, writers, the number of the more pranksters. I mean, how many times mm. did Mark Twain write that somebody <laughs> had died when they hadn't actually died because he was either mad at them or messing with them or, yeah. you know. So, yeah, or they report he was dead. So Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's if it's somebody that famous that we can ID, okay, this was a, a game that he was playing with somebody else. But if you don't know that, if you don't know that that reporter was feuding with the guy one town over and they both did that, then all of a sudden you could have conflicting, you could have somebody dying 20 years before they actually died. Well, if yeah. what you're paying attention to happened 10 years after they supposedly died, yeah, it becomes a lot. Um, for that reason, I, I spend a lot of time um, paying attention to cemeteries. Um, now, again, <laughs> tombstones can and frequently are incorrect, but I do feel at least a little bit safer and that it's etched in stone, literally <laughs> saying, okay, I believe this is the person that I'm looking for. Can I, he likes to trace them from the beginning. I like to trace them from mm -hmm. the back. I found where they are buried. Can I work my way back from there where yeah. they probably died around this area or else their family was. And then if that's their family, then that's their family. So um, yeah, driving around libraries, articles. Um, and then we just, we just are researchers mm -hmm. by nature. I, I actually am employed as a researcher. Um, we are researchers by nature. We're kind of always doing it. Like he said, we're kind of working on about five books at any given point in time. Um, and just as we see things related to them and, you know, we have one book that leads to another book. And this is not the only sort of dual set that we have in our, um, in our collections. Yeah, and the nice thing about that is when you're looking for something, it's often hard to find, but if you aren't looking for it, it may turn up. And so then we just file that away, knowing that we'll use it in a future book. That's excellent. It's a wonderful discussion. Yeah, I, I was gonna go ahead and open up to see if anyone has, any of the audience members have any questions. You can even use the chat or if you wanna unmute. But while we're seeing if anyone has any questions, do you have any like upcoming projects any of you would like to share or how, we, how uh, readers can connect with your work and where you sell your books and- Book your, Loft, of course. Yeah. Book Loft, okay. Yeah, and our, you know, check our website because it lists all our books, which is www.explodingstove.com. And we're, we've got a book that'll be coming out next February, probably. And it's a follow-up to a book we wrote a number of years ago on the history of the Kahiki Supper Club. And so there's gonna be a second book about the Kahiki Supper Club. Uh, it's more of an emphasis on the legacy of the club. Yeah. And we've got more wonderful stories, more artifacts that we've turned up. Uh, uh, color pictures. Yeah, lots of color pictures. Uh, so it'll it'll be, you know, we hope, equal, if not superior to the previous volume, which was pretty popular. But you can always find us at Exploding Stove on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Redbubble, if you want to buy shirts with our book covers on them. <laughs> and you do, believe me, you do. <laughs> At Exploding Stove. <laughs> right. <Excellent>. <laughs> <laughs> and Scott, do you have any upcoming projects or that you're working on? I'm not in between projects right now, just, just yeah. working on, on the new book. My website is scottlonger.com, and I usually update it frequently about where I'm going to be and what I'm going to do. Actually, uh, a week from tonight, I'll, I'll be coming to Columbus, looking forward to it, to the Bexley Library, doing a talk there on Victory on Two Fronts at uh, seven o'clock. So that, uh, that I'm looking forward to, as well as uh, some other local things in Cleveland. Excellent. And Janet, do you have anything else uh, that you're working on right now? I, I'm not currently, I'm, I'm still contemplating what my next book is going to be, but I have two books that I uh, wrote several years ago, co-authored co uh, on uh, Grove City, uh, my hometown. Okay. And uh, the, uh, both of the, I uh, wrote both of those for uh, Arcadia Publishing. And um, uh, my books are, all three of my books are available uh, on Amazon and also, uh, Trouble on Scioto's Waters um, is available uh, through um, uh, Bookloft and Orange Fraser Press down in um, uh, Wilmington. So, um, yeah, I, I hope to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Uh, David, uh, David commented that the Kahiki Supper Club book was the biggest selling book two years straight at the festival. Congratulations. Yeah, it was a great place. 
I loved yeah. it. it was. Yeah, yeah it's, I was gonna say I wish we could take credit, but I think it's more the subject than the authors. Yeah, it's a, it's <laughs> one of those real fun topics. You know, we've gotten to meet some wonderful people and interviewed them and collected stories and drinks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the mystery there'll more, drink. There'll Everybody be more recipes right. in this, <laughs> more recipes in this book, like it was in the first one. Um, but it kind of brings it up to the, you know, where uh, where we sh should view Tikihiki now in the terms of the overall uh, tiki culture. Yeah, yeah. Scott, do you, are you familiar with the, with that restaurant, Tikihiki? You know what we're talking about? No, I really don't. <laughs> no. It, yeah, it, it was the, it. The, the world's greatest Polynesian supper club. It was a, the kind of the mothership of of uh, tiki palaces and uh, even more grandiose than the Maikai in Florida. And uh, however, so, the Maikai is still standing. Yeah, but it, it was around for 39 years and now it's a Walgreens. No, it's a parking lot. There's parking no lot. Walgreens, oh, Walgreens anymore. It was, yeah, no, it's a parking lot. Uh, or an abandoned lot. The yeah. Walgreens isn't there anymore. Yeah. I was, I was lucky enough to eat there a couple of times before they, they finally closed it up. That was sad. Well, we're in the process. Of, you know, we went to take some pictures of the last remaining Moai here in Columbus, one of the Moais that stood outside the door. And we're hoping that it will be uh, repaired, rehabilitated, and available for people to see again. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, there's a lot of interest in it. Yeah, it's, it's our desire that it be uh, restored and, and publicly available, viewable. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sure Cleveland, I'm, Scott, I'm sure Cleveland has its fair share of historical uh, restaurants and things like that that have become iconic. It's not yeah. as historic, <laughs> but if you like cheeky, there's always a Porco's Lounge in Cleveland. Yeah, that there are there are a number there are a number of them. There's um, yeah. um, East Side and West Side. There, there's a, at least three or four that I think off the top of my head that. Uh, I've been around for many, many years through prohibition, and uh, they still continue now. And, and people, people enjoy going to them. Well, do we have any questions from the audience members or anything like that? Feel free to use the chat, or if you, oh, um, Courtney and if you're going to insult us, be more clever than that guy earlier who just. I was, I, I was ignoring that. I was ignoring that. He's gone um, now. If you're going to insult us, be more clever. That's yeah. all we ask. <laughs> I'd like to mention. This is my first historical novel. Hello, I must be going. Mostly true oh, okay. story, an imaginary band. And it's a, a book about uh, an imaginary band that starts out in Columbus and the members break up and end up going to New York City. And then they come back to Columbus to have a reunion. But what's unique about it is since 1983, I've been actively collecting information on music history in Central Ohio. Now, I've interviewed 1,000 musicians easily. Tens of thousands. And anyhow, so I've incorporated their stories into this novel. So a lot of, there's about 80 people that are real that are that interwoven through this novel because they interact with my fictitious characters. And this is the first of a trilogy, so. There's actually Very a question cool. for Scott, though. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, Scott, you have a couple of books for younger readers. Do you have a different process for writing those than you do for an adult audience? Very good question. Yeah, it is, it is a good question. Yeah, you have to look at a different perspective in that what might be important for a child that would interest them as opposed to an adult. And also think about things that uh, even with curriculum that the kids might not be that aware of what was going on at the time. Talking about pre-television, pre-radio, I don't think the, too many children are aware that that actually happened, or pre-computers. You know, talking about horse and buggies and people living on farms and, and, and the way people live. So that's what I would tend to do. When, when I wrote my book on Cy Young, who uh, is an Ohioan and a native of Tuscarora County, born, uh, born near there, um, I would try and uh, and write things that might educate uh, a young, somebody eight to twelve years old that might not have known. And I like to talk about early baseball and explain the rules. That's what I would kind of do: is how the game was then, as opposed to what they're seeing now. 
you, know, you wouldn't see seven relief pitchers. You wouldn't see uh, other things. You wouldn't see entertainment at the park. It would be just wooden stands and people there to see the ball players and, and what they were doing and ball players interacting with the crowd, which you, which you wouldn't see now. And, and afterwards socializing with the people there. It was a totally different world. So I try to put in American history from post-Civil War to, uh, to what people are doing maybe through the 20s to 30s. And hopefully children reading it will get a little better perspective of America was and, and baseball in general, what, what was going on then at, at those particular times. Cy uh, played baseball from the 1890s through about 1912. So there was a lot of changes that went on in his time. And I tried to reflect those moving pictures and movies and things that were, that were coming along and, and how they got started. So I guess the main thing is you just, you need to look at a, a perspective of what might interest or be good to learn for somebody who's uh, 12 years old as opposed to somebody who's 51 and has gone to college and grad school. That's, that's a challenge, I think, of writing for children. It's a very good question. We have a question um, for Janet. Where would you tell someone to go to look, look at pioneer life in Ohio? When I was a kid, my folks took me to Schoenberg, Schoenbrunn Village in New Philadelphia. Ah, well, um, you know, you, uh, I, I've been to that particular place for sure. I would definitely put on my list if you want to um, take children somewhere uh, where they can really start to dig in uh, on Native American history is, you know, to go pl to places like Serpent Mound, which I, again, I think is fascinating, Fort Ancient, all of, and some of the state parks uh, where they can um, go to a visitor center and um, talk to some of the, the, the people who work there there are always plenty of books in the in these places that you can pick up and um, learn things from. Uh, there, you can go practically up the Scioto River, and there are many parks along uh, the Scioto River that you can stop and take a look at uh, to um, explore. Um, where the American, uh, where the, the Native Americans walked, uh, some of the things that they, um, where they would cook and fish and, and all the things that, that made them um, such a unique uh, people, I think. And uh, in the back of my book, I have a, a whole section of places with museums uh, and other um, sites that they can go to uh, to, uh, to take families, uh, some of them are free, some of them are very low cost, and uh, uh, just pick out an area and start to explore it. And again, you can go to, um, for example, Battelle Darby uh, Metro Park and visit uh, the Moss, uh, Boss Mound, which is a Fort Ancient Mound. If you wanna take a trail back and walk it, you can see what life would have been like, um, you know, 2,000 years ago. There are many places that you can do that. Ohio has a lot of history, and yeah, the Serpent Mound. I think it was it's going it's being designated a World Heritage Site. That's how it's it hopefully will be. Yeah, and of course, then there's the New Earth Newark right. Earthworks and the Hope Well uh, down in the Chillicothe area that. Um, I guess next year uh, they will be deciding whether that will become a world heritage site, and that will. I really hope that happens. Yeah, it's a big. That's a big deal. It brings a lot mm -hmm. of visitors in. Yeah, yeah, Ohio has a lot of different things to see. Do we have any other questions? This has been a great discussion. I was going to ask everybody in their trips doing research around Ohio. Coming back to food again, if you have any favorite off the, off the path of diners that you like to visit when you're out in the driving around. You don't have to answer that if you don't want to. We actually just made a spreadsheet of these like a week and a half ago. <laughs> yeah. because, um, I, for about two years, it felt like we weren't really able to go to any cool diners. Um, so kind of looking to see what's what's still around, what's still alive. Um, we probably have 75 or 100 on our list. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, there's, uh, if you like Tiki, again, there's Tiki Underground in uh, Hudson, Ohio. They're actually moving locations, but they have food. 
Um, yeah. We were at the Made Right Diner not that long ago, which is a hamburger stand. It's really good. Greenville. Greenville. Yeah. Now I was, <laughs> I thought you were going to ask a different question. Uh, <laughs> so he's going to answer that so one. So I'm going to answer that That's one. I'm going to pose that too. Because, uh, you know, if you're interested at all in the Underground Railroad, there's a lot of places to go in Ohio, but the place to start out would be Ripley. Because there's like 28 or 29 different you know, structures of things that are associated with it. They've got uh, John Rankin's house there. You got John Parker's house, two really prominent members of the Underground Railroad and a lot of little sites there. And it's right on the Ohio River. And there's some nice restaurants down there. <laughs> so it's, it's a good place to take a trip and just a lot of history uh, just, just walking around the town. Yeah, when I first started researching the Underground Railroad, that was the very first place I learned about. And we, we actually went there a couple of weeks ago. It was not a very good weather, but it's a very interesting little town. A lot of history there. In Ripley. Yeah. yeah, it'd be nice if they got a lot of tourism so that they could do more work yeah. to restore the area. And then there's a really great diner just outside of Delaware, Ohio, uh, that we ate at the other day, uh, just oh, yeah. on 23. Real surprising, good menu. Yeah. To answer the question you actually asked. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, it's a classic diner. <laughs> you know, actually looks like a railroad car. And, and David uh, pointed out to next Wednesday is U.S. Grant's 200th birthday. Anyone taking part in any celebration? I think my invitation must be in the mail. I was going to say, David, <laughs> David, how does one celebrate Grant's 200th birthday? I'm not sure what the proper protocol is there. <laughs> you know, his wife yeah, had sure. a bad eye, and so she always wanted to be um, shown from one side because she didn't like her other eye. I did not know that. Nellie Dent yeah. Grant. I had paper dolls when I was little. That's the only reason I know any of this. <laughs> Well, I, I don't think we have any. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. There will be a cel oh. there will be celebrations down in this birthplace in Point Pleasant. Okay. See, I only go to Point Pleasant for the Mothman Festival. Yeah, there, there. I've been to that as well once. <laughs> it's very entertaining. I enjoyed it. Excellent golf cart tours. Yeah. Well, I don't think we have any other questions. Uh, um, so unless we. Uh, I don't see anything. No, nope, nothing in the chat. I really appreciate everyone logging on tonight. It was a great discussion. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Nice yeah. meeting you all. Yeah, I'd like to thank the Ohio Inter Library for putting this together and please enjoy the festival. All right, you take care, everybody. You do. Thank you. Good night.